fan and thanks to uh, Memorial Forest Network. And I, I think if we can go live afterwards, we can also have the website for Rate Your Professor. Uh, I'd like to see those numbers climb. I don't know about you. I'd like to really get engaged with this as a social media project. Uh, I thank Stefan very, very much, Stefan McLaughlin, for that presentation, for the work that's being done in documenting and doing some on the ground science to look at what's happening to particularly keystone species that are important to the um, to the Athabasca Chippewa and the Mississippi Cree of that region. I'm going to talk about an energy policy, but because I just can't help myself having worked years ago when I was with Sierra Club, uh, going on to Fort McMurray to oppose in particular there was an environmental assessment process uh, on the, the first of the Shell Jack Pine uh, oil sands projects. By the way, you may notice I use the term oil sands. Be very transparent about this with you. I've never explained it publicly. I had a pollster explain to me that Canadians, when polled, find oil sands sounds worse than tar sands because oil is filled and tar doesn't. So we're having this sort of um, you know, ridiculous um, uh, enemy word contest where Albertans regard you as an enemy if you say tar sands, and the environmental movement thinks you've caved if you call them oil sands. Now, bitumen in northern Alberta is neither tar nor oil, nor by the way is it crude when they start talking about shipping it out, which is one of the things I want to talk about tonight. So since it's not tar or oil, I don't see any reason to make Albertans mad at me before I start talking, especially because oil sands is a term that turns people against the project. So, I just call them oil sands, and I just want to get that out of the way. So the first of the Shell Jackline projects, Sierra Club of Canada, and I was executive director at the time, was the only environmental group in the interventions, uh, as an official intervener in the hearings at Fort McMurray, that actually opposed the project going ahead at all. There was an oil sands coalition group that was doing good work, trying to push Shell to having a less damaging project. And they did good work. I'm not taking anything away from them. But it was a rather unusual position to be in, to be the only group there, just the two of us, trying to stop the project. I raised this because even then, now this was back in, as far as my, my memory tells me, it was 2002. It may have been 2001. But even then, the local doctors were talking about what they were seeing of health effects. And one of those local doctors was not John O'Connor at the time. This was just a general description of what people were seeing. The cream who testified talked about how you could no longer go in the bush and make a cup of tea with the water you found there because it just didn't taste right. Something really wrong. You had to pack water if you went in the bush because you wouldn't want to make tea with the water that you found in the areas that were traditional. I remember it so clearly. That was before the first phase of the Jack Pine uh, shell, shell project. The current level of the Shell Jack Pine oil sacks project produces 255,000 barrels of oil a day. And it's important for you to know, just in terms of context, that Neil Young's Honor the Treaty Tours is specifically about funding the court case that's now been brought by the Athabasca Chippewa Cree to oppose Jack Pine II. Shell, Shell has now received permission to go to another 100,000 barrels of oil a day from this area bringing it to a total of 355,000 barrels of oil a day. This will make more sense when I talk about the whole context of the, the whole Athabasca oil sands uh, um, project and the goals of expansion. What it, what's really striking about this particular project, having worked on the environmental assessment of Jack Pine 1, this is the first time that an environmental assessment ended up concluding that there were adverse environmental impacts that could not be mitigated. Adverse impacts on wetlands, on wetland plants, on migratory birds, on biodiversity. But even more striking, they said there were adverse impacts on First Nations treaty rights, adverse impacts on cultural and traditional activities of First Nations people. Now that was a finding in July of last summer, July 2013, when the environmental report came out on Shell's proposed expansion. And there were, since these findings were rather negative initially, the federal government said, well, we won't push it through to an approval until we look into this more. 
And then they pushed it through to approval in December without having notified any of the First Nations involved that the earlier statement that things were going to go on hold for a while, that going on hold was off and they were going to approve it. This is also very significant in that it's the first time that a Minister of Environment in this country has approved any such project while finding, as a matter of fact, and confirming, yes, there will be adverse environmental impacts which cannot be mitigated. Yes, there are adverse impacts on treaty rights, First Nations cultural and traditional activities. Yes, that's all true. But the benefit of letting the project go ahead, go ahead outweighs these adverse environmental and treaty right impacts. Now, that's the first time that's ever happened. I think it's important to raise that as a context because the whole project of honoring the trees, there's been very little, I don't know about you, but having worked closely with this issue over the years, I'm frustrated by the media coverage that sort of focuses on, well, how did Neil Young get there? What did he do? He doesn't have, like, did he drive? Like, oh, okay, so he has a car that he converted so it doesn't use, well, who built the car? I mean, Neil Young must use fossil fuels somewhere. So, I mean, the level of discourse focusing on Neil Young as a Canadian celebrity, and what right does he have to talk about treaty rights? Well, how many people would have ever heard the Athabasca Chippewan First Nation talk about the treaty rights if Neil Young hadn't been picking up the cause and talking about the need to raise funds for what would be a very costly court battle to protect the treaties? And again, as you heard in the video, of uh, the community there, the Chief of Council, aren't saying they're trying to shut down the oil sets. They're just trying to make sure there's enough there for them to survive and honor the treaties. So that's one little window into the larger thing I wanted to talk about tonight, which is energy policy in Canada. And are we capable of thinking like a country? I say this because the case against the oil sands uh, on the economics has never been made. The case for the oil sands on its economics has never been made. They don't have to make it because they assume, they, Stephen Harper and crew, assume that if they say often enough, it's good for the economy, it's good for Canada's national interest, or as Leona Huka just said, sure there are these adverse and final impacts that cannot be mitigated, and sure we're not supposed to approve a project when we find that as fact, and sure there's going to be adverse impacts on the treaty rights of First Nations peoples, and we are required by the Supreme Court of Canada to protect treaty rights which are constitutionally enshrined. The federal government has a fiduciary responsibility to protect those treaty rights. But we're going to ignore all that because it's so obvious. You know how often Stephen Lewis says obviously? Just track that when you're watching me speak. Obviously. And obviously is usually said about things that aren't true. So obviously, <laughs> obviously, obviously, the US ends are entirely important for Canada's national interest and you know, we have we have advertisements uh, television ads that are completely indistinguishable between whether they are the government of Canada taxpayer ads or the Canadian Association for Petroleum Producers ads to tell us that my goodness don't you know that when you pour your coffee in the morning you wouldn't be able to do that if it wasn't for the oil sales. <laughs> you wouldn't be able to send your child to school. You wouldn't be able to buy a tube of toothpaste to protect that child from cavities. Every single good thing in this country comes from the oil sense. That's what we're told on a daily basis. And you know what? People end up absorb, even the people who believe that the environmental costs and the climate costs and the impact on First Nations is worth consideration, often fall in the trap of thinking, yeah, but it, yeah, it really helps the economy. So, just for fun, shout out if you know how what percentage of the GDP is represented by the oil sense. I think it's three. Somewhere between two and three. I was going to go with three percent, but you shouted out two, and that shows you're on the right track. Because if you listen to those advertisements, you would swear that Canada's schools and hospitals and economic activity are entirely dependent on the oil sands. Very small proportion of national tax revenue, too, but that has a lot to do with the fact that we have the lowest corporate tax rate in the industrialized world. Now, roughly half of that in the United States. Okay, so let's examine the oil sands in the context of an energy policy, looking at Canada's 